Robert Lampert is uh, the director of the Frederick S. Party Center for Longer Range Global Policy and, uh, and the Future Humane Condition. He's a principal researcher at RAND uh, and a professor for, and of policy analysis at the Party RAND Graduate School. And his research, uh, as you might all have seen in the title, um, focuses on decision making under conditions of deep uncertainty uh, in various areas such as uh, climate change, risk management, uh, infrastructure. Uh, amongst, I will not list all of the accomplishments, and but amongst them and almost uh, 20,000 citations, I looked it up on Google Scholar. Uh, he was inaugural uh, president of the Society for Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty, and also the corresponding lead author for the Working Group 2 of the sixth IPCC assessment report, which um, assesses the impact of climate change on ecosystems and uh, human communities on a global and regional scale. Um, his book, Shaping the Next 100 Years, New Methods for Quantitative Longer-Term Policy Analysis, analysis, which he wrote together with Stephen Popper and Stephen Banks, uh, personally is one of the most influential texts for my work, as it lays out very concrete ways on how to come closer to robust decisions for the future, instead of optimizing for only a few scenarios. So I'm very happy and glad that uh, Professor Lamprey is here today at our Digital Urban Culture Lecture Series at the City Science Lab. And now, um, Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you very Great. much. Thank for you so much, Rico, uh, for, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all. And uh, let, let me let me dive in. And um, <clears throat> um, I'm happy to take questions during my talk. I think we'll have lots of time for discussion afterwards. But if people want to jump in with questions, that that is fine too. Um, and uh, my, my my work tends to be. Uh, very broad. I mostly work in climate change, but other areas as well. Um, so I've tried to take a couple of city examples when I get to the example part of the talk. But um, um, you know, there's a, a number of issues I think would be great to discuss, which which aren't really in the slides, like the connection between these DMDU techniques and and say digital mirrors or digital twins, um, uh, the sorts of visioning processes that you may use at all. So anyway, so I think. Um, lots to discuss. So let, let me let me dive in. Um, <clears throat> just to you know, start with um, you know some some stage settings. Um, you know, there's um, a lot we know to we can do to shape the future, even if we can't predict it. In some sense, that's kind of the bumper sticker of for uh, much of my work. Um, you know, so. Uh, you know, there are things we know for sure about the future. It's it's going to surprise us and that we need good information to, to have a, a decent chance of steering it in the direction we like. But, um, you know, we we both need quantitative information and we, we know we're going to be surprised. And so um, much of my work is about how do you, you know, how do you resolve that that tension? And so it, you know, it may seem obvious that what you do with quantitative analysis is to make predictions about the future and then make those use those predictions to inform policy. Um, but you know, in many, many types of problems, in particular the ones I think you know we're all engaged with here, um, predictions, while a core principle of the scientific method can complicate the use of quantitative information. We have deep uncertainty, we have a lot of contestation, both about the, the system about our values. And so there, fortunately, there's a better way than predict than act to, to use our analysis. Um, uh, a bit of, you know, a little bit more, more scene setting um, is um, this idea that uh, a transformation is inevitable. Um, the, the, the IPCC Working Group 2 report certainly applies that. It doesn't quite say it, um, at least in the summary for policymakers. But, you know, I mean, I think there, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, that, that you know, some sorts of transformations are inevitable. And this um, is slide is just a, as I go through the build is going to kind of collect, you know, so some of the basic forces of that, you know, over the last um, <clears throat> 70 years, you know, we've had this great acceleration Real GDP per cap, uh, go, goes up by about a factor of ten. Um, uh, population's gone up by a factor of what is about um, uh, five or six. Most people have moved to cities. Um, we've lifted several billion people out of poverty. Um, 
But during that time, you know, uh, income inequality, actually equality between nations has, has, has grown while inequality within nations has tended to increase. This is, uh, you know, one of Piketty's charts for the U.S. Um, uh, I, I've really been interested recently in uh, the economic historian Brad DeLong's book, uh, Slouching Towards Utopia, which is really interesting, I think. But he talks about the long 20th century, so starting around 1870 up to the financial crisis of you know, 2008. Um, in 1870, he credits um, uh, the corporation, uh, corporate research labs, and, and globalized markets, starting in the Atlanta, Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic world first, uh, is finally breaking out of the Malthusian trap and giving us this gigantic spurt of growth, which has many, many good features, but at the same time has had lots of um, adverse ones. Uh, we have the inequality here. Here's the planetary boundaries where, um, you know, the human society is overrunning, um, you know, our, uh, the, the Earth's ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> interesting, I think, for the for for our topic here is he talks about um, uh, the whole idea of slouching for utopia is that um, you know every thirty years income GDP per capita is doubled and um, uh, you would think at the beginning of any such doubling that, you know, once we double, all our problems will be solved and it never does. Um, he talks about different ways of managing that and so basically says we had about 30 years of, of social democracy, at least in, in the, you know, uh, OECD world of um, essentially, you know, cooperation between government, uh, labor and business, sort of very top down. Um, that kind of broke down in the 70s. Since then, we've had uh, more emphasis on, you know, the market is always right. That seems to have broken down around 2008. And we're, you know, searching for new management strategies. So, you know, with sort of that vision in mind, you know, much of traditional policy analysis seems inadequate for today's world. Traditional policy analysis, much of which had its foundations laid, um, you know, in the, in the early post-war era, um, in that period of top-down management, it has uh, you know assumes a single decision maker, assumes a single vision of the common good, and it assumes that um, you know systems are predict predictable if complicated, so that you know if one works really hard, you can come up with a plan which you know you should might expect to unfold reasonably as you as you planned it. You know, and whether we ever lived in such a world, we uh, clearly don't today. Um, today's world is very much characterized by policy centric governance, you know, in the um, Eleanor Ostrom sense that, you know, no, none of the big problems we face is there a single decision maker or hierarchy that controls it. Everything is, 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 a, is an interaction of, of independent but interdependent agents. Um, diverse views of the common good and systems are complex. In the lower left-hand corner, I've got the Kneffen framework, um, which you know, uh, distinguishes simple, complicated, complex, and, and chaotic systems. <clears throat> and you know, for our purposes here, complex systems are different than complicated ones because they, they may be often difficult if, if impossible to predict though we can understand them you know ep, you know the world's evolution the world's ecosystems are a perfect example we can understand the processes in great detail and explain many of the past to you know that gave us the ecosystems we have but that wouldn't allow you at any point in the process now or any time in the past to you know predict the path things would have followed so you know essentially we need a policy analysis that deals with wicked problems we have this distrust in institutions, many voices, and the need for transformation. So what do we do? Um, <clears throat> this idea of decision-making under deep uncertainty is a set of methods, concepts, and analytic tools which are meant to address some of these challenges. Basic idea is we're gonna stress test policies over a wide range of futures and try to identify ones that are robust and resilient that meet multiple objectives or make sense for multiple worldviews. Um, uh, and over many, many uh, uh, scenarios. Um, you know, strong emphasis on multiple, multi-objective and multi-scenario analysis and trying to set up this iterative process of goal setting, stress testing, and new solutions. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of variations on this theme that this book uh, from a couple of years ago now 
on DMDU, theory from theory to practice, is a collection of, of, of essays of, of people who are working in the space and really, I think, gives a, you know, that, that's a nice uh, textbook for, for what's going on in this field. Um, and then uh, the book that, that Rico, you mentioned, um, um, which we did a number of years ago now, um, emphasizes this point that, you know, that the computer is not, least of these problems is not a tool that tells us what to do, but it's a prothesis for the imagination, helping humans navigate, imagine better and, and navigate um, successfully into the future. Okay, so <clears throat> done bullet one, want to give you an overview of one flavor of DMDU, this robust decision-making, which is uh, the, the, the type that we generally use at RAND, um, give you an overview, take you through the steps, show you two case studies, which I think uh, touch on uh, some issues that you might find interesting. The first is a largely qualitative DMDU style visioning exercise for Culver City, California. And then this um, more abstract look at this idea of analytics for multiple worldviews. And then um, some observations on, on DMDU and urban transformation. Okay, so um, many of you may have seen this, yeah, you know, this pattern, which is, uh, you know, in the literature for a while, but you know, traditional <clears throat> policy and risk analysis is based on a consensus understanding of the future. And so it, it basically follows the steps is that first we come up with a consensus understanding of what future conditions will be. Um, you know, still many people organizations have a you know a single best estimate forecast, but properly what you're supposed to do is have an enumerated set of future states of the world and then a joint probability, single joint probability distribution over those states. Once we have that, we can have some sort of utility function. We can rank our decision options, say which one is best. Um, and then we can do some sensitivity analysis to, to see which, um, uh, how sensitive our um, uh, ranking is to, to what we think the uncertainties are. And because it relies on this consensus understanding of future conditions, um, to begin, it, it's usefully called predict and act. Um, <clears throat> so predict and act, there's a whole you know, vast number of, 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 of methods that fall into this category. Um, very powerful, many problems for which this is the, um, you know, the proper way to go. And I always say you would never get on an airplane, um, or I suppose a high-speed train, where the people um, who um, built it and uh, you know, operated it didn't work very well in this paradigm. But for many of the problems we face, uh, predict and act can go wrong. Um, there's a real pressure to underestimate uncertainties because if you admit how big they are, you can get pretty much any ranking. Um, competing analysis can contribute to gridlock. So you know, a policy recommendation is predicated on a forecast. If you don't like the recommendation, it's often easier to attack the forecast because that's uh, often more likely to be wrong than, than the uh, policy recommendation is, has at least some beneficial uh, features. And the quest for prediction distracts us from what can often distract us from what really ought to be the main task, which is seeking creative solutions that help us achieve our goals in the face of uncertainty, as opposed to just working to reduce the uncertainty. And these conditions where predict and act breaks down in these ways um, are, are what we call deep uncertainty. And here's the formal definition occurs when the parties to a decision do not know or do not agree on the likelihood of alternative futures or how actions are related to consequences. So essentially the probabilities are non-existent or imprecise and we have, may have structural uncertainty in the models. Okay, so let me take you through an example. Okay, so what do you do in these situations? DMD essentially turns the, um, analysis on its head and it runs the analysis backwards. So we start with our goals and thoughts on how to get there, plans for how to get there. We use our analytics to not predict what's gonna happen, but to answer questions a lot, such as in what types of future, what are the key characteristics of futures where our plans meet our goals and where they miss our goals? Under what types of futures would you do plan A versus plan B? And those sorts of questions often yield a lot higher confidence answers um, than uh, in a world of uncertainty than do predictions. And then once we have those stress tests, 
And this is often then a locus of, of where we can try to seek some stakeholder consensus. Once we have those stress tests, then we can use that information to try to identify new and revised plans that are more robust, that work better over a wide range of uncertainties. Um, robust decision-making is one common DMD approach. It's multi-scenario, multi-objective. <clears throat> Basically it's designed to identify robust strategies, characterize vulnerabilities of such strategies, and look at, at trade-offs, because uh, there's generally trade-offs among different uh, robust strategies. Um, and really, you know, there's a lot, lot of often complicated analytics here, but this, the concept is really simple. We're gonna be using our models and data, not as predictive tools, but rather as um, exploratory tools, use them to stress test policies, and then use those stress tests to try to find um, more robust and resilient strategies. Okay, so let me take you through a quick example of these ideas. I mean, this is some work we did a, um, almost 10 years ago now um, for the city of Los Angeles. Um, they um, need or required to come up with a, um, um, a, uh, a, a plan to meet the uh, US federal water quality goals for the Los Angeles River. They did a, um, the, the standard regulatory analysis that they, uh, that they traditionally do, ran their optimization models and came up with a strategy that looks like this. Um, the little pie chart shows the, essentially the amount of runoff that gets captured by each of three general strategies. Regional pro projects are big spreading basins, you know, spaces for the water to go. Green streets are making the, the, the public infrastructure, mostly roadways, more um, permeable so the water runs into the ground as opposed to in the river. And LID is low impact development, which is essentially changing um, land use and building codes so that private property captures more water. So the challenge is, however, that they, <clears throat> they really didn't consider uncertainty in this plan, particularly climate change. And so the question is, is this plan resilient to climate change or not? So um, we did an exercise with them. Um, we took the same models that they had been using for their regulatory analysis and stress test them over a wide range of futures. So this is the uh, initial result. You get a big database of points. And here I've labeled the ones where the plan meets the goals, meets federal water standards in blue. Red is the plan misses the goals. You know, so sometimes it meets goals, sometimes it doesn't. So what, what do you do with that big database of information? We run classification algorithms against it um, and basically ask the algorithms to give us a scenario plot where, um, which is low dimensional, in this case, we asked for two dimensions. So what are the, the uncertainties th that you put on the two axes that do the best job of separating the blue and the red dots? And then where's the separation line? So it turns out these two um, uh, uh, uncertainties, these two drivers um, and that line does the best job you can possibly do of getting the red dots all on one side and the blue dots on the other. This gives us two scenarios, one in which the plan meets goals and one in which the plan doesn't. Um, the green X is the, um, the, 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 the best estimate conditions the city used in its plan. Um, essentially the horizontal, the dots and the horizontal lines are uh, a variety of different climate projections um, sorted by the um, uh, the the maximum uh, twenty the, the most extreme twenty four hour rainfall one means the same uh, that's unchanged over the next twenty years twenty percent means the extreme rainfall event event gets twenty percent larger et cetera and the <clears throat> the the different lines um, you know going up and down vertically are different um, um, scenarios of uh, land use in the city over the next twenty years. Um, uh, uh, organized by the uh, the percent of impervious area, area that is um, a percent of land cover that sheds as opposed to absorbs water. So what you see is that um, if uh, if climate meets um, if climate the extreme uh, weather event does not change very much, or if the city does a really good job of um, uh, creating a lot more pervious uh, uh, land cover. Um, that the plan meets its goals, 
if those conditions don't hold, the plan misses the goals. Um, so now we can ask the question, should the city worry about this plan misses goal scenario? <clears throat> Here we can now start looking up at the, the science of climate change and what can the, the climate scientists tell us. So it turns out that the full range on the horizontal axis is the CMIP-5 um, IPCC climate scenarios um, weighted um, equally, with, um, probabilistically. So that would suggest, hmm, so climate change might be a serious problem. You can do another bounding case. Oh, okay, I was gonna show you something else. Okay, so um, I was gonna show you some other um, uh, probabilistic estimates from various other climate uh, science communities, but they all agree that if land use doesn't change, uh, the city uh, is a significant chance of, of missing its water quality goals. So what does it do? Um, well, we might develop a more robust plan. Uh, we might make that plan adaptive, consisting of current plan, things we'll monitor, and contingent actions if the signposts are observed. And so if we just begin with the current plan, we might run it out for 20 years. Uh, but we, then we also monitor, and the scenario map tells us what to monitor. And um, what we monitor is whether or not the city is achieving its uh, land use, uh, newly mandated land use goals, which is the second line from the bottom, or, um, and if climate, whether the climate science, what the, whether they can guarantee small storms. Um, and if we hit those signposts, we might augment the current plan, which we uh, develop by just looking at what we would need to do to meet goals within the red area. So um, this would be an adaptive plan, which would be more robust than the current plan. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I copied an animation wrong. This is one of the, um, uh, another one of the, 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 the climate science probabilistic estimates. So that's sort of the lower bound. The, the wider is a, is a wider bound on the probabilities. And so in either way, you, you should worry about the red area. Okay, and now, should you um, uh, adopt this um, robust or this um, uh, adaptive plan? So now we look at how strategies perform across our multiple goals, which are meeting water quality standards and cost. In this, we can, we can project this in a very simplified way. Look at our two scenarios, look at our two objectives. Um, if we are in the plan meets goals scenarios, the current plan, meets both the quality and cost, um, or uh, begin with current plan, prepare to adjust, which we saw on the previous slide, also meets um, water quality, is a little bit higher in cost though, because you need to um, have, spend money to keep the options open, to go to the adjusted plan if you need to. Uh, we could also have a plan where we begin with the augmented plan and then jump down if we decide that's appropriate and that would cost most. We look at the plan misses goal scenarios. Um, the two um, uh, uh, ad adaptive plans meet water quality goals. The uh, begin with augmented plan is the uh, is the least expensive because it's best aligned with what turns out to be the future. Um, the current plan misses uh, the water quality goals and costs the most in that scenario. So the middle one, the begin with current plan, prepare to adjust, is robust in the sense it represents a lower regret strategy. It's neither, it's optimum in neither scenario, but it does well across both. So this, in this case, would be a suggestion for a bus strategy for the city to follow. Um, one final thing to mention here is, sorry about my voice, it's, it's been going a little bit, but um, is, Having done this modeling exercise, we can now go back with, um, with, with humans and ask the question um, about surprise, essentially. Is what's missing from the models that might significantly change our answers? And it turns out that in this case, um, everything I've showed you so far um, uh, is driven by zinc uh, deposited on roads as the uh, limiting pollutant. So in other words, if you get zinc if you meet the federal standards for zinc, you meet them for all the other pollutants that, uh, that the city needs to worry about. In LA, the source of zinc mostly comes from automotive brakes. 
We're um, in the midst of a potentially large change in automotive technology, which may, and, and transportation more generally, which may in fact change the deposition of zinc on the roads. And thus this analysis, zinc may no longer be the limiting pollutant in the future. And you would have to redo the analysis with, with other limiting pollutants. So we didn't get as far in this as actually going back and doing redoing the analysis, but we did tee up what surprises might give you a significantly different answer. So just to review what we did here, multi-scenario, multi-objective analysis built on the client's single scenario analysis. So same models used in different ways. Uh, we ran many hundreds of, of futures and then clustered them into two policy relevant scenarios. We then brought in probability range to interpret the implications of the scenarios. So the probabilities are a framing device, you know, well into, not an input to the analysis. And then we use adaptive chat, a strategy to achieve a robust strategy. And then we did three iterations of essentially human machine collaboration, stress tested current strategy, use stress test results to design a robust strategy, and then it did a human red team analysis to stress test the robustness of the strategy. Great. Um, and then just again, sort of a, a bumper sticker, basic principles, consider multiple futures, not a single one in your planning, choose the futures to stress test your plans, Seek robust plans that perform well over many futures, not optimal design for a single best estimate future. Often you achieve robustness through robust uh, flexibility and adaptivity and use the analytics to facilitate exploration, problem solving, solving and deliberation, not using computers to tell people what to do. So prediction can be perilous, um, plan over multiple futures. Uh, the little girl's got her you know, computer under arm, consider uh, multiple futures. And a key idea is that we're managing uncertainty by identifying plans whose good performance is insensitive to what we don't know, not by throwing all our resources, analytic resources, into trying to reduce what may often be irreducible uncertainties. Okay, let me, um, any, any questions there before I jump onto the case studies? Okay, let me, I'm gonna, I guess a little bit more framing, which I'm gonna skip over uh, in the interest of time. Um, okay, here, yeah. So um, let me just, um, <clears throat> I'm going through the three steps of a, <clears throat> of a RDM DMDU analysis and uh, framing the decision, stress testing. And then I think you guys were interested in multi-objective robust decision-making. So let me talk about that as a way to develop adaptive plans. So, here are a couple of definitions of robust strategies. The, uh, the, the first one is the one that um, I showed you in the uh, LA water quality example. Um, um, all of these um, generally lead you to uh, relatively similar answers. Um, a robust strategy is often one of these adaptive strategies that is near-term actions, signposts and contingent actions. So we have a number of futures. We take near-term actions, we monitor signposts and for particular combinations of signposts, we have um, actions we can jump to. So how do we come up with these strategies? Um, the one, the LA water quality example I showed you was essentially, um, you know, the strategies were handcrafted because that was relatively simple, but in general, they'll be more complicated. So um, multi-objective robust decision-making, Mortem um, uses analytics, uh, robust multi-objective um, optimization algorithms to suggest strategies. And it, so it, <clears throat> uh, these algorithms spit out um, these Pareto, um, uh, multi-objective Pareto surfaces. So for instance, if we're doing a, a water example, we're often interested in you know, good, high reliability and low cost, which would you know, put us down in the lower left-hand corner, but you know, such a perfect world is often un unobtainable. So we may have a whole bunch of solutions which give us different trade-offs between reliability and cost. Um, and you know, there's trade-offs among these. What we're doing is presenting this curve to the decision makers so they can decide where they wanna be on these curves. Um, but the key thing that we're doing is finding those strategies that um, um, are 
on the Pareto surface, meaning that you can't do better in one uh, objective without being doing better uh, on the others. So um, Mortem often uses multi these multi-objective robust decision-making algorithms and just a little, um, this is supposed to be um, animation, which is not working, but essentially this is a three-dimensional version of this. They're evolutionary algorithms, these dots. Not gonna, oh, right. The idea is that these, it shows you these dots floating around and they, they iterate down and uh, to, to the surface and then spread out equally and to give you nice, uh, the nice Prado surfaces. So here's an example from some recent work that has to do with um, um, uh, the pandemic response in, in, in California, <coughs> where we modeled um, um, the, the health department strategies as these controllers, which basically had different sorts of rules for what they monitored, um, um, uh, you know, hospitalizations, deaths, um, uh, measured infection rates, et cetera, um, and, and how they responded to them. And what you find, and we're interested in, you know, sort of days of lockdown versus um, uh, deaths from COVID, is that there's a whole class of strategies that um, um, are dominated um, over both these metrics by others. And that if you modulate the, the, the signposts and the, you know, that the, 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 the health agencies are telling the public, you know, under these conditions, we'll take off mass mandates, that sort of thing. If you do that in a certain time dependent way, um, no matter over a very wide range of uncertainties having to do with, uh, you know, the R factor pandemics, um, how variants change, et cetera, et cetera, those, those style adaptive strategies, and then also then how you communicate those um, are dominate most other ways of doing it. Um, and so this actually proved pretty useful once it got done in, in the latter stages of the pandemic. Okay, so let me go through two urban case studies. Uh, the first one is for Culver City, California is qualitative. Then I'll give you a, um, um, this uh, very mortem based uh, multiple world views idea. So uh, Culver City is uh, a, an independent jurisdiction, about 40,000 people um, part of within the LA metropolis. It's basically between um, Santa Monica where Rand is on the beach and downtown LA. It's about 12, 15 miles across <coughs> that picture. They put together a transit-oriented development plan, which was trying to significantly was trying to significantly reduce car use in the city and and then cut through traffic because the Culver City is essentially a trans um, a, a, a transportation crossroads um, in in this uh, in the geography of of the city. So it's it's low land that a lot of transportation corridors go through. Um, so they're trying to get people on on other modes and then get rid of the um, uh, the cut through traffic. So um, um, one of, uh, after they had done this, one of the neighborhoods um, came up with uh, their own implementation plan, which they claim was consistent with the, um, the city plan. Um, and, uh, but it, some worried that it would dump a lot of traffic um, in, neighbor, in other neighborhoods. So solve the, 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 the one neighborhood's problem at the expense of everybody else. So we worked with the, the, the city government and the neighborhood groups to, to go through this visioning process <clears throat> where we essentially did a, a scenario visioning of what would constitute success of the city plan, develop pathways to get there, stress test the pathways, and then came up with robust, robust and flexible plans. This was all essentially a co-production, co-design process with, um, uh, city staff and the neighborhood groups, and very much in a, the DMD style. So the, the visioning process is a back casting, which we found super useful on this. Um, in this case, we used the, um, the, the 2028 um, LA Olympics, which was uh, about eight years in the future. When, no, actually 10 years in the future when we did this, now four. Um, and basically the setup is, you know, covered by the net by the 2028 Olympics, Culver City has um, um, successfully implemented its mobility plan. 
Um, you know, the world is flocking in for the Olympics. Uh, you know, all these out of town visitors ask you, wow, how did you do this? And you tell them the story. So then we write down those stories and extract out of it um, what seem to be the consensus and the contested values that people use to, to talk about success and what were the various policy interventions that people talk about to get there. Um, and not to go into this any detail, but using these three horizons framework, we then organize the, the outputs of the visioning into strategic concepts, met for a while with city staff to organize the strategic concepts into plans that they thought they could implement under various sorts of conditions, brought those back to the, um, the group and did um, stress testing, you know, uh, which is basically a qualitative version of the, the quantitative stress testing, which um, um, uh, gave you know, the, the failure modes of different types of strategies. Um, this is using an approach called assumption-based planning, which is basically a qualitative way to do the sort of uh, scenario clustering I showed you. Um, and then uh, eventually then <clears throat> came up with this uh, adaptive plan which um, allowed a phase in of the, the various um, strategic elements um, uh, in, in a revised neighborhood plan, which was meant to be um, almost as effective for the neighborhood and um, um, uh, also um, uh, you know, less impact on the related neighborhoods. So this whole process actually allowed the city to move forward a lot faster than they had otherwise been, allowed them to make actually some pretty big changes uh, when the pandemic hit. Um, and so they, they got stalled out as we came out of the pandemic, but they're still roughly following um, this, this sort of adaptive plan and this whole structure has proved very useful for them. So let me now do uh, give you a much more abstract example and then um, close and we can dive into discussion. But you know, the, many of the problems we're facing here, you know, Culver City was a you know, minor case of you know, or a small scale case of urban transportation. But um, we're, we're trying to deal with these wicked problems here. And often considering multiple worldviews is a way that in the planning and other literatures is a way to, to, to try to get one's hands around these wicked problems. Um, in this context, a worldview is a comprehensive conception of the world a correlated set of values, beliefs, and policy preferences, which one uses to filter what, what understands. So essentially it captures the, the, the observation that generally what people think, how the world works, what they, how they think the future is gonna unfold, what their um, uh, goals and preferences are, and what they regard as um, uh, acceptable means to ends are often strongly correlated. And if you knew like one part of that, you can figure out and uh, you know what they believe in one part of that, you often know what they believe in other parts of that. And so to deal with such problems, uh, you know, the literature, many literatures on this, they generally uh, envision iterative learning processes, this idea of frame reflection, trying to see the problem through other people's eyes, and then this idea of clumsy solutions, which contain elements of different worldviews. So how do you implement those ideas analytically? So this is um, uh, essentially a desktop stylized exercise to, to try to work through some of those ideas. We envision a town on the shore of Pristine Lake. There's um, uh, different populations in these town, the town, some whose um, livelihoods and, and identities are wrapped around um, the, the use of the pristine lake, others who are interested in, in more economic development, uh, which uh, could pollute and despoil the lake. Um, there's proposed development, what should the town do? Um, and there's many uh, deep uncertainties, including you know, the tipping point, at which point does the pollution level in the lake tip the lake, eutrophy it, and turn it into something that's completely unusual um, in its previous form, uh, how well the, the pollution intensity of different options and the effectiveness of different policies. So how do you proceed in this space? <clears throat> Since this was a desktop, ex I mean, had this not been a desktop exercise, we would have gone and done surveys, focus groups, worked with anthropologists to understand the different worldviews in the community. Um, 
we didn't have the opportunity to do that here. So we basically just worked from some colleagues at IASO who had been doing this sort of work um, in some Italian villages affected by landslides. And we just pulled, um, and they were big believers in the cultural theory of risk. So we just used their framing of different worldviews and applied to this problem. Um, so I'm gonna be using this cultural theory of risk language, which is useful here, but not essential to the basic analytic points. But have three groups, the hierarchists, egalitarians, the individualists, three very different worldviews. Um, they have different expectations about how the lake and the economy work, um, different sense, sense, senses of what sort of um, means are appropriate ends, uh, appropriate to, to pursue one ends and different goals. <clears throat> We're using these little Hollings ball and, do, ball and uh, cup diagrams to say that uh, you know, the hierarchists tend to believe si the systems are manageable within, at least within certain limits. They favor both regulation and training. So that, you know, uh, the full suite of policy options that we made available in the model and very interested and excited about this adaptive management we talked about. And they believe in trade-offs between different objectives. The egalitarians tend to be a lot more distrustful. They think the lake is very fragile, that the, 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 the economy or the industry sector is very resilient. They distrust training because they think it just undercuts their, their way of life. Um, they favor regulation. They distrust adaptive management because they think that'll just um, confuse them or a way for people to sneak out of their obligations. Um, and they really focus just on objectives that affect the traditional sector and, and, and not much else. And then the individualists think the lake is resilient, um, the economy less so, distrust regulation, favor training, and they also favor adaptive management and tend to want to maximize opportunity and autonomy. So essentially what we're going to do is an RDM analysis for each of these different worldviews and then examine how the solutions from one worldview look from another and then look for solutions that work across worldviews. So not to go into this <clears throat> too much detail, but for each, um, um, uh, uh, each of the worldviews, we have a sort of look at policy, a mix of regulation and training using uh, controllers, roughly like the ones I showed you in the, um, the, the COVID-19 one. Um, we run the Mortem algorithms and find a whole bunch of solutions which have um, uh, these multi-dimensional, uh, uh, multi-objective uh, trade-off curves. This is one that shows unemployment, trade-offs between unemployment, um, pollution, and um, economic growth. And we find good solutions for, from the point of view of the hierarchists. And then I showed one solution that we're going to, and each of these parameters here are different coefficients in these um, uh, control functions. Um, we can do the same thing for each of the worldviews. And they, as you see here, they have very different um, types of solutions and very different trade-off surfaces. Um, we can then do these utopia dystopia matrix where we say, you know, how does a strategy taken from one worldview work in another worldview. And so the first line here is how does the hierarchist strategy work um, if the actual, if the world turns out to be the way the egalitarians think it is. And so we have a whole bunch of objectives here. And basically we're looking at the regret, which is we calculate as the distance between these Pareto surfaces. Um, and you know, a big number and, and a lot of red means that the that strategy, in this case, the hierarchist strategy in the egalitarian worldview does really badly. So you can look across this and actually at the egalitarian strategy does not too bad in the other worldviews, except it's pretty bad on the, on the economy for the individualist worldview. But in general, there's no strategy that works well across all the worldviews. So we then go through an iterative process, fiddle with the, um, the in this case, the design of the strategy. And what we do is instead of forward looking at activity, we do backwards looking at activity on the theory that that might be a little bit more acceptable to the egalitarians. 
and you can come much closer in that way <clears throat> to a robust strategy that works across worldviews. Okay, so um, just a couple of comments to close. You know, ensuring the future of the city may require transformation. Um, transformation inescapably involves normative judgment. So we really do need to think about this multiple worldview idea and the types of analytics we're talking about um, can very much deal with that. I didn't give you examples, but it, people have used this to look at multiple jurisdictions pursuing common strategies that address their, their multiple interests and are very much designed around these probe and response adaptive strategies that, that are the appropriate management response for complex systems. Um, <clears throat> to step back a little bit and try to put this into a, you know, a, 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 an ethical and you know, moral reasoning framework, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the way Amartya Sen lays these things out. And again, um, not, not to go through the, 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 the full details here, but he very much um, thinks about um, uh, contrasts the notion of trying to come up with a perfect vision of the future and then move towards it, saying that's often not possible or nor necessary, and rather talking about how deliberative processes can help us um, um, sort the options actually before us and iteratively move towards a um, more just solution. Um, these um, uh, DMDU processes are very much designed to facilitate this sort of deliberation with analysis where parties to a decision can define objectives, options, and parameters that then goes into the framing of the analysis. Participants then work to work with the results of the analysis to <clears throat> rejigger, to rethink their goals, their, uh, their, their, their plans, uh, what they think are the, the, the relevant uncertainties. So in the, um, the, the Lake model example, you know, we reconfigured what an adaptive strategy might look like. Uh, and at each stage of this, the DMDU techniques are designed to focus on high confidence analytic information like the results of stress tests um, <clears throat> that enable the participants to have a common under analytic understanding that they can then uh, uh, discuss and try to understand the contested parts of the problem. Um, and again, the DMDU principles and the idea that deep uncertainty may seem daunting, but embracing it helps decision makers to identify strategies that they can actually then use to manage this uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> thanks for your attention. and. Excited to, to dive in with you in questions. Yes, thank you very much um, for your lecture, for the for the theoretical input, and as well for the um, concrete case studies and examples you, you brought forward on both this more more qualitative side and uh, um, and also also the quantitative methods and how, how to fuse them as well. Um, I for myself have a lot of questions which I. I think we don't have the time to cover all of them. Um, okay. I guess there's also um, a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I think I would just write, j jump straight into the discussion. Um, yeah. And then after a couple of questions, um, open up the floor for, for everyone to also ra raise your hands or type them in the chat, um, depending on your preferences. Um, maybe to, to also give you some some context on, on the work that we do here, which is yeah. uh, very applied. So we do a lot of, we work on digital urban twins for, for and together with the city and administration. So design tools um, together with the administration um, so that they really use then the mm -hmm. different web-based tools and applications that we provide them with for expert mm -hmm. planning, for data narration, for scenario exploration and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering in terms of this um, process that you just showed us in the very end between deliberation and analysis, mm -hmm. where I think this is, assumes that the analyst is very much the interface between the decision maker and then potential outcomes. That when we work with concrete tools for mm -hmm. decision makers, which they then use in their daily practice, yeah. I was wondering if you had some experience <clears throat> on really 
implementing these um, in like the daily practice of decision making so that there is not like an external analyst from academia or from a private mm -hmm. company that does the decision making, but really embedding these thoughts on, on deep uncertainties into different tools. Do you know how can this be done? Maybe yeah, you have some um, thoughts on that. Yeah, um, no, really good question. Um, most of our you know, tooling and engagement um, are, um, I mean, are, are in for longer term decisions. So I, I don't know if you day to day means, you know, daily decisions or, um, uh, you know, the, the, they're, they're integrating it into the ongoing processes of the organization. Um, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, the the deliberation with analysis i mean the, the the way i laid it out and described it really envisions um say like a a water agency developing a plan with its um you know stakeholder input and so um th this goes to the polycentric governance idea so that you know you've got say a, a lead agency but it needs to engage with um you know other jurisdictions community groups, et cetera. And so that you, um, you know, typically would have, you know, meetings where, um, uh, you know, it's, um, there, there are public meetings, people talk about, and you try to organize people talking about, you know, what, what they care about, what they want to do and such. Um, the visioning part, then you build tools that um, address those questions, you come back and, you um, say, show them the results of the vulnerability analysis and um, then come back and show them uh, potential strategies. Um, so it's, um, and then often, you know, on occasion, you know, oftentimes then those tools and the processes for using them, you know, get take, taken up by, by the agency themselves and they just, you know, use this process. So um, the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation, um, which um, uh, in particular is the, uh, the, the federal um, manager of the, uh, the Colorado River system, which um, you know, in the Western United States, which um, um, you, you, I'm sure you've you know, been, been seeing the horrible pictures of the nearly empty reservoirs and that sort of thing. So um, we, we've done a series of work with them over the years and they have pretty much adopted these techniques and they actually have a, a web tool. I can send you the, um, uh, the link, but which is allows um, users to go on and um, do stress tests of, of strategies for managing the river with the idea that as over the, you know, as, as the, the federal agency deals with its, um, uh, the, 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 the state governments, it's, you know, essentially uh, the seven state governments, a couple of big uh, environmental groups and the, uh, <clears throat> the federal government, which are the negotiating partners over the, 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 the plants for the river, you know, I, I think they envision, the reclamation envisions that many stakeholders will go to the site, do stress tests of their favorite strategy, do stress tests of, uh, you know, the people they don't like their strategy, um, and then use that to shape their, their, you know, their public positions and the negotiating positions. So that, I think, is an example of you know, turning these into tools that, um, you know, are then, you know, used as part of the ongoing process. Okay, and then, um, following up on this, I think you, you need like then a lot of training for these people in the organizations, right, to, in order to enable them to do the stress testing <coughs> and so on yes, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah reclamation okay. is essentially the, uh, the, the sort of the social process was the, the more senior people, there's a cadre of senior people who um, uh, really saw in this the, a, a useful way to proceed um, and um, spent a number of years hiring up a bunch of grad students who come out of the, you know, our operations and other groups that do this. And once they had, yeah, so they, 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 hired, they hired the skills to do this. Okay, because... Um... Just for us in the context, we have, for example, planners who wonder where to put a new park, where to put a school, where to put yeah. a kindergarten, and so on in the social fabric of, of the city. And then, of course, this will follow with a lot of, like, there could be 
a yeah. whole bunch of uncertainty involved in doing that and then the effects on the district, for example. Uh, and right now there's only very limited ways of really dealing mm -hmm. with all of these uncertainties involved. And I think there's a push for, you know, having robust decisions in where to place mm -hmm. this urban infrastructure, uh, like be that greenery or be that mobility and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, and I was also wondering in, in that sense, when you talked about the signposts and the, the mm -hmm. adaptive pathways and the adaptive planning, how would you turn that into like regulations also under changing political conditions? I mean, you come up with this plan, you come up with the signposts, yeah. but how does that work in like daily political practice? Yeah. Um, I mean, a challenge certainly um, in the, um, yeah, I mean, envisioned in the, uh, the LA example was that the, the, that the, that it's hard to monitor or know, you know, what 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 climate science is going to produce, and so that, but the the permeability of the land surface is something that they they in fact monitor. So that would be the thing that they would um, um, pursue. Um, it in it it envisions that um, you know the plan would be um, that you publicly. Um, uh, you know, rather than coming, you know, rather than coming out with, say, a thirty-year plan that says we're going to do this over the next thirty years, um, that agencies would build discussions of contingencies into plans. So you see that happening to a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> the Metropolitan Water District, with whom we've done a, a fair bit of work um, in, in this style over, over the years, um, there they, you know, have internalized the capabilities. Um, but um, you know they they talk some about uncertainty in their plan. I mean, more so in the technical, and, and uh, as as you go up more towards the, the most public facing documents, they they talk about being ready and resilient and that sort of thing. But you know they <clears throat> they they explicitly have you know we're going to do these things um, because we know we need them which is generally um, uh, building up local supplies and, and, and enhancing conservation. And then we've got a number of contingencies, which often involve um, various sort of, um, uh, you know, desalinization, either of ocean water, which is the hardest, but of brackish groundwater um, as things that we don't think we need yet, um, but we're going to, you know, do the spade work to, to to be ready to use them if we need that, which is to work the regulatory angle to, um, uh, you know, do test small test pilots and things like that. So you know, so they they do try to build in those contingency plans. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, oh, one more thing on that is, is what the Culver City people yeah. did is they um, they put in a bunch of the lane closers with. Um, <clears throat> you know, not as permanent concrete at the beginning, but as, you know, sort of the plastic bollards. Um, again, making the, the, the argument that, um, you know, let, let's just try this out and see what people think. And, uh, you know, which, which made it easier to do. Okay, I see that uh, Hilke raised her hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and sorry for not turning my camera um, on, Robert. Uh, still facing the problem that my my um, computer is not working. I would be interested in. I mean, I really like this notion that one is not really able to predict any future, and that all those tools are basically decision support um, tools in a way. Mm -hmm. But like from your years of experience and all those different kind of theories that that you um, developed and implied also in practical ways, to which extent would you say that all those models, all those tools that help decision making somehow still have a huge impact on those futures in regards of, yeah, not predicting them, but, but um, <laughs> shaping them? Yeah. You mean the sense that um, you know the the predictions are often the the model predictions are all, all often self fulfilling. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, but I mean, isn't it a, in a way that 
if you even if you say okay we we need to integrate those different world views and we have this like um, deep uncertainty level that we need to navigate that already creates like kind of a model of the future in itself and i was just mm -hmm. wondering how this is some in some regards also kind of impacting the way that we think about future i think that yeah. the frame the framework already somehow is impacting the way how we how we yeah how we come up with like coping with those different kind of uncertainties right yeah i have a, i have a background in, in cultural science maybe i should make that transparency yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> um i'm wondering in which way yeah those integrating of different worldviews also different kind of takes perspectives but also methodologies um yeah you you consider and how how this is impacting the decision making in itself yeah um Wow, that's um, a, a gigantic question. So let me, let me take pieces of it. Um, I mean, I think there is certainly a, um, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I think any sort of analysis un, uh, unavoidably takes, um, you know, um, asks you to, adopt a, a certain framing and um you know had a particular you know and and has um some type of normative stand so this um <clears throat> um this this very much uh framing you know very much um um it proceeds from the assumption that um uh you know uh, First of all, that uh, you know that that you can construct, you know, the the groups of people can constructively come up with with policies, and that you don't want to, you know, um, uh, you know, leave everything to market forces, etc. Um, it um, it does have this, you know, very you know, uh, Amartya Sen like framing of you know accepting. Um, a diversity of views and as a fundamental at, and valuable attribute of the world and something that you want to deal with. Um, the, um, uh, you know, I mean, if you, uh, you know, if, if you're working in this style, it does drive you towards these um, a, a adaptive, you know, we're going to adjust policies. And, and certainly there are, <clears throat> there are cases where you know just you know um uh you know committing to a uh, a a goal and not allowing any adjustment um sometimes is is a better strategy to realize something i mean in principle that the analytics in this might lead you to that conclusion but that's um, you know that it, it, this this sort of framing is is biased away from that, um, um, and it's certainly I mean one things that I find interesting about the the the, the Lake model example and you know and the egalitarian side and um, and then um, also when you actually think about dealing with with groups of stakeholders and how do you get you know all the voices you'd like in the room um, I mean this is certainly a um, you know an analytic. Um, you know, uh, you know, you know, analytic, rational based view of policy from which you can get stories out. And sometimes we do that, but is not primarily, you know, sort of a, a narrative or story based. And so it is, you know, e e easier for some groups than others, which is a, a challenge in, uh, you know, bringing, you know, a full, full set of communities. I don't, I don't know if that um, if that addresses your question or not. Yeah, thank you. I think it is a super huge question <laughs> and <laughs> very, very hard to, to give it like a like a sufficient answer is not is not possible. And may I address a second one just out of curiosity? Sure. <laughs> Are you working in interdisciplinary teams or is it like is it more that you have a group of experts and then you work with multi-stakeholders in yeah, further developing your theories? 
Yeah, no, in, 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 in any real policy analysis, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the like model thing is just, you know, in, in the desktop top analysis, sometimes they're, they're, they're often narrow, but in the, um, in any real engagement, we have, you know, very multidisciplinary teams, both on the research side. And then um, often are, are, you know, try to, to the, the extent possible, you know, do knowledge co-production um, in the sense that, uh, you know, what's in the model, um, how we configure the strategies, um, how we can configure the uncertainties is um, is is co-produced with um, um, the client and then and or you know the community. Thank you. Okay, if there are any other. Um questions please either type them in the chat uh, or or raise your hand I'm not sure I can Kim? See the chat. yeah um i have a question about the different worldviews or at least mm -hmm. in the terms of uh of planning um, yeah. from an urban planning background um i would say it's not necessarily always a worldview issue but a certain issue of the community so which mm -hmm. communities are being affected or serviced by yeah. a planning effort and in certain cases, uh, legally or not, you have to wait one community's experience or worldview of a new planning situation higher than another. So, uh, mm -hmm. with, for example, accessibility planning uh, for handicapped people, especially with mm -hmm. ADA rules in the States. So how do you approach something like this when you have these, um, yeah, let's say whether they're legally prescribed or not certain communities mm -hmm. that have to be prioritized in a in a stress test or for the outcome yeah. of the plan for them which may not be in alignment with overall goals from the larger group yeah um i mean much of that is a is you know a political question but um and this is information for political processes you know exactly where you draw the boundary is is interesting and unclear but um from a, let me answer from both an analytic and then sort of a, a, an engagement perspective. I mean, from an analytic perspective, if there are, um, uh, you know, particular constraints on the system, um, you just, you know, you build those in. And if there are particular, you know, values that, um, um, and community, in particular communities that need, whose you know, that values or objectives need to be prioritized over others, you would, you know, set that up in the modeling. And then, you know, whether you do that by, you know, running it without that, you know, running it for all the values and then, uh, you know, pruning the set that you actually look at by throwing away those or, or do it from by other, some other technique. I mean, basically you, you can build both the constraints and the hierarchy of values into the, into the results that, that come out of the modeling. So you could do that. Um, from a, uh, you know, and, and then, and now I was, you know, let me slide in the engagement side. Um, you know, one thing that you might do or that would come out of that analytics would be ways that you can do the best possible at um, uh, addressing other groups or other stakeholders' um, goals and, and interests given those constraints. So, um, you know, in some situations, it might be, um, uh, you know, that might actually be very valuable to say, well, these are constraints, and but, you know, this is how we can do the best job of, uh, you know, given those constraints, um, uh, addressing, um, uh, ad addressing your needs as well. Um, you know, I mean, you know, obviously it's not hard to, um, uh, you know, envision situations where that um, that sort of transparency of what's being traded off against what would, uh, you know, make some people would, would 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 not convince some people and would make them even more annoyed. And so that's, you know, that's um, a, um, a, a some, sometimes uncertainty or you know, ambiguity can be strategically useful, and uh, you know, in, in there are cases where these sorts of methods can actually help with that by allowing agencies to, um, you know, 
admit a wide range of uncertainty and then use that as a way to bring different groups in. But other times, clearly, they might be better off not making certain trade-offs transparent. So, um, you know, that gets into your duty as an analyst or what projects, you know, you're most useful for and that sort of, those sorts of questions. Okay, maybe maybe tying into this, I, I would have a, a follow up question. Um, to which extent do you let the models typically themselves to be co designed with the stakeholders? Like, how much can you make them look into the code, into the assumptions which go into the code? Um, yeah. How do you open that up to in the process as well to build trust, or do you typically? Yeah, I mean, um, how do you do yeah, this? Yeah, no, we never, you know. Never as strong, but um, I'm, you know, I, I think the answer is we've never, you know, used code that people can't see into, and you know, to the extent that people want to look in it, we do. Um, in some cases, um, you know, like the the um, uh, the water quality example I showed, you know, we're using the the client's model, and sort of the the social dynamics is that, um, um, you know, we work closely with the technical staff. Um, on what we're doing with their model, how we're configuring the running the scenarios and all, and um, um, any adjustments or additions to the model, because, you know, say, giving it a capability to do adaptive strategies where it had not been originally built to do that. You know, that we all do. Uh, we'll do very carefully with the, the staff. And then um, <clears throat> when you're dealing with the, 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 the political decision makers or the community, you know, the, the, those people will often look to their technical staff, you know, like, okay, should, you know, should I believe the model again? You know, the people in the back will nod. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we do that. Um, when, um, um, you know, when we need to develop a new model with stakeholders, um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, to the extent possible, we'll, um, you know, try to, to bring people in and um, uh, certainly, um, do decision, what we call decision framing or decision structuring processes where we try to understand, you know, what they think um, are the, you know, key relationships, what's connected to what and try to show um, how it's in the model. Um, you know, depending on the audience, I mean, sometimes you downplay the model part and just show them the scenario maps and, you know, show them that under these, can if you do this under these conditions, you get the thing that you expect, but if these conditions are different, then you get something else. And, you know, and that you understand the, uh, you know, how, how to communicate what the, why the model gives those different answers. Um, and that that's the level you operate on. And so it's basically, you know, showing them that the analytics you have reproduces the, the results as they would expect them, but gives them other results under different conditions. Okay, thank you. I see there is a question from Alexander. Yeah, hi, Rob. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, Several of these other questions have touched on the idea of uh, what referred to laws, and and this has made me sit here reflecting on many of the contexts, uh, particularly in the examples you gave, are highly statute regulated decision making yeah. contexts. Um, so I, this is one thing I keep coming back to because I'm working with law and trying to find a way to make DMDU fit with legal decision making mm. frameworks. Yeah. Um, could you maybe speak to some of your experiences where the law has either enabled some of the things you want to do, like taking um, broader worldviews into account, but mm. equally, you know, where there's been barriers and you've been frustrated that it hasn't been a more iterative um, decision making cycle as DMDU uh, sets out to achieve? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, certainly in the, um, you know, water water in the, the Western US. I mean, there's requirements to do long range planning. Uh, there's requirements to, to include stakeholders. So um, that gives a, you know, a, a, a regulatory basis to, you know, to, 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 to pursue with the agents because they're, they're required to show that they can meet, um, you know, reliability cost, environmental goals uh, over long time periods. So that, you know, um, 
that solves the why should I do long range planning uh, problem for you. So that does the case where, where it helps. Um, <clears throat> one case where um, um, it, it, it has really been hindering, which we, you know, we're, we're in the midst of trying to figure out at least some ways into it is in the transportation sector where, you know, it, it's not quite written like this under U.S. law, but the way that the, uh, you know, federal, what the federal government requires um, from metropolitan, regional metropolitan planning organizations to um, qualify for federal money is um, sufficiently detailed and onerous that by the time they've run their, you know, great big, um, you know, very detailed planning models to meet the federal requirements, there's not much time, energy, or, uh, you know, staff uh, work time to um, uh, to do lots of scenarios. So <clears throat> the, you know, the, the, the way into that, which there's like a bunch of different groups trying to, to work at this point is, is um, uh, you know, having a whole hierarchy of, uh, you know, much faster running, say strategic level models, which are much easier to, to run multiple cases with. And then you use that to organize the, um, uh, the runs of the, uh, the much, uh, um, you know, slower running, high, much more highly detailed uh, models that fit the regulatory requirements. But um, so hopefully that will work. Um, but, you know, that's, that's been a barrier. Um, in, in, the, in the water quality stuff in California, there's, um, um, you know, there's actually interesting legal questions as the extent to which the, uh, the current legal structure you know, is compatible with, um, with um, uh, you know, adaptive planning. And, you know, the, the consensus among, you know, the, 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 lead, you know, the lawyers we've worked with is yes, but that's actually never really been tested in court, you know. So, um, you know, whether someone really got pissed off at the 30-year plan, which has all sorts of contingencies in it, whether, uh, you know, the court would say, yeah, that's, that's reasonable or not. So there's not not any case law on that. Cool, thanks. No, that's uh, that's been my impression. But I just uh, well, like your example with the Culver City. Uh, next week, I'm going to a PhD workshop, and it's about better planning for Olympics. Um, mm. So it's nice to hear that there's a DMD study, yeah, per, engaging with those issues. Okay, uh, great. I did, yeah, I just was wanting to find out if there's any blind spots that I haven't come across okay. yet. So thanks. Okay. Cool. I would just uh, jump in. I have sort of a more like wrapping up type of question. It's not really wrapping up. Maybe it's opening okay. new things. Um, okay. But first, I appreciate mentioning the transportation planning in the States because I think that's the best example of this traditional policy, like assumptions that you mentioned. There is a single decider mm -hmm. and, uh, and a single understanding of the common good that more or less sums up transportation <laughs> funding policy yeah. in the States. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to know, so we highlighted several different points, and there seem to be a lot of different case studies um, using mm -hmm. these models. Um, so what's next uh, on, on the further development conceptually or, or places where this hasn't been applied yet that um, you're targeting with your team to bring the ideas in? Yeah. Um, um, I mean, you know, sort of like the directions you had is, uh, you know, sort of a mix of, uh, you know, what need and opportunity and, you know, uh, so um, uh, I'll, I'll give you an, an answer to the question, though, you know, that's not to say things that I don't, that, that I've chosen the best places and uh, things that I don't mention aren't, aren't really important, but um, <clears throat> I'm doing, um, as I say, work in transportation planning. Um, you know, with federal money to work with various MPOs uh, to try to get their, essentially their planners and their modelers to work together and do this sort of analysis. And, you know, the challenges are um, getting, um, you know, reasonable um, uh, fast running models that then can coordinate with the, uh, the much more detailed models. And then all the cultural issues of, you know, bringing these different mindsets into it. Um, so there's body body work on that. Um, been uh, doing some work with um, uh, 
conservation biologists on, uh, you know, how do you do conservation planning uh, under climate change in, the, in these methods, um, which uh, there, <clears throat> the, the challenges are, there's, you know, kind of, um, I mean, first, the, the climate change impacts on biodiversity are huge, and um, uh, there are fewer, um, it, it's harder to get, you know, kind of a couple of concrete um, constraints out of, you know, highly uncertain models. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty in the water world, but, you know, you know, water flows downhill unless you put energy from someplace to make it go uphill, right? And so, you know, and, and if you got that in the landscape, that uh, tells you, gives you a lot of constraints on strategies, right? And that you can work with. Um, let's see, what else are we doing? Um, <clears throat> um, doing, um, sort of pushing the multiple models, um, uh, uh, multiple worldviews idea in, in looking at um, as a, essentially um, social cohesion under systemic risk and using a bunch of historical databases and different, you know, historical interpretations of, of key social forces and trying to, so that's, that's pretty abstract, but it's, it's, it's a, um, um, a con concrete communities, which have very different um, worldviews in terms of, um, you know, how the world works in addition to values and where we can actually, I think, do a lot of extracting models from uh, because, you know, there are communities who have, have pretty strong mental models in their head that we can try to uh, instantiate in models. Um, and then um, we're doing projects with various water agencies on, you know, so the real nuts and bolts, you know, so they say, okay, great, we want to do this, you know, here's our model, here's, uh, you know, here's our process, how do we actually make the analytics work? Um, and, and this is a case where, you know, we're basically working alongside the, the staff of the agencies and um, we'll hopefully, you know, both help them with the plan and, and when we leave, um, have, have trained them up so that they can do these, these methods. Okay, there is, I've seen one question from the chat, um, which is about the uh, emergent properties of the complex system that you model um, as a crucial property, um, how the optimization models are aware of that, how, how, they, how the emergent properties are incorporated and what your opinion is on this um, very, very broad notion yeah. on, on emergence. So, I mean, ideally, you know, you've got a model which produces a, you know, a, if it has emergent properties, essentially, you know, you may have a pretty rough landscape um, of, <clears throat> of, of outputs from the model um, that the optimizer is dealing with. So, you know, um, in principle, the evolutionary algorithm ought to find um, um, these, um, uh, you know, sort of local, the, the various local maxima and um, help you find, you know, for instance, you know, you think of it in a control theory way, ways to, you know, nudge a system with a bunch of, you know, different attractor basins, you know, nudge it towards attractor basins that um, you, you find, um, uh, you know, um, more desirable. So, I mean, in some sense, the, you know, the, the, this approach of, um, using evolutionary algorithms to find, um, you know, strategies and um, <clears throat> then the, you know, scanning over multiple futures to find places where the, the, the strategies break and then see if you can hedge. I mean, it's designed to deal with that, those sorts of problems. And, you know, um, uh, in, we've got a number of, of you know, toy cases, um, where that works, I mean, the, this lake model is is uh, is it's got very strong tipping phenomenon, and there's a bunch of papers by a bunch of, you know, it's been used pretty thoroughly in the DMU li literature to 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 look at these these sorts of properties. So, in principle, one can get um, there. Um, you know, the in the um, in when you're doing a, a real world problem, um, you've got a challenge of you know, does um, your model have the right feedbacks? So that you get the you know um, uh, emergent properties that are sufficiently um, 
realistic that um, the strategies that you develop to, to be robust against them are going to be robust in the real world. Um, <clears throat> in part, this you know red teaming idea is meant to get at that, but um, you know I, that that is um, uh, not you know there's there's not enough of that that out there to uh, you know to, to sort of prove the case or understand under what conditions that always works and what conditions it may not work. Um, and then um, you know the challenges of, of dealing with with complicated models, uh, you know complex system agent based models. I mean there's there's um, is uh, you know can be computation very challenging. We've got some we've done some work on climate you know different institutional designs for carbon pricing with um, uh, models with uh, strong emergent properties. Um, there's in the um, uh, uh, you know pandemic uh, infectious disease space. Um, we've got a lot of um, work um, with um, uh, you know which which have uh, you know social network based. Um, um, uh, models of, uh, you know, how, how individuals uh, come to decision about vaccination, you know, what sort of, uh, how they're going to respond to pandemics and um, uh, which have very strongly emergent properties. And so, you know, people have used these techniques on that. <clears throat> so there is some work in, in that area, you know, um, so, you know, um, uh, but lots of, uh, lots of details on it to get worked out. Okay, thank you. Um, there may be one last question before we have to wrap due to the time, um, which is also, I think, slightly referring to to uh, Kim's question: what What's next? And and uh, I think a lot of power lies in, in the visualization of these model results, and we've seen yes. like either very complicated uh, scientific charts of mm -hmm. hundreds of thousand scenarios run, which are very hard to interpret if you don't have the knowledge. Yes. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's this red, yellow, green thing where you go like red is really bad and green is very yeah. good. Um, and that's typically like this traffic light system is what um, decision make makers are used to see. Yeah. I was wondering, do you see in the future, do you see like some in between or where, where would you see the in between those things? Is it possible? Is it even necessary uh, to have like yeah, a... No, yeah. No, yeah, visualization of, is yeah. Um, really important. Um, um, I mean, I tend to like the the scenario maps for, um, you know, which go a little bit beyond just the stoplight chart, but, you know, where you show, um, you know, what key drivers, you know, where different policies work, where they fail, you can put little X's that show where different groups come out on those maps. I mean, those actually um, can be pretty, um, be pretty powerful. We, we've actually done some, um, structured lab tests and things like that, you know, to kind of see what people get out of those. And so um, I think those are useful, but um, I think the uh, subway maps for adaptive strategies, which um, you come out of the adaptive pathways literature, and I showed you, you know, a little bit. I mean, I think those um, can be pretty useful for thinking about, um, um, you know, um, talking about adaptive strategies with wide audiences. I mean, much better than the control theory formulas that were used with you guys. I wasn't sure how mathy this group was. Um, and um, so I think those are important, but yeah, no, I mean, I think a, a really important and big um, uh, research area, I just, I'm not really doing much in that space right now. I've done some in the past, but there's other groups which um, do this sort of stuff and, but a lot more can be done is, is really the, um, you know, systematic user testing of, of different um, visualization types um, and with, with different groups to understand how do you communicate um, these ideas um, most effectively. Okay, then um, once again, from my side, thank you so much for, for coming here, for, for giving the lecture on, on uncertainties and how to handle them on how to make more robust decisions. I've so seen some comments in the chat, which uh, also thank you. So I think this has been a very insightful uh, afternoon for all of us Euro Europeans here. And with that being said, um, I think we can we can now clo close off the session. And uh, once again, thank you for being part of it. Well, 
Yeah, thank you all. Really enjoyed uh, meeting with you and, and your questions. So thanks so much.